there are certain expectations that are there on women in real life today uh, you know that she will cook and not complain that you know she will handle both the outside and the inside and just because she's working outside doesn't mean that she's not got to be on the top of her kitchen or you know she's still responsible for cleaning her house and things like that and these are all real so you know we are not kind of arguing that uh, you know this is not happening in society but when you spend billions and billions of rupees and dollars over different categories over decades over all different media you know and they say that an ordinary consumer today is exposed to 6 to 10000 pieces of advertisements in a day now imagine if all of those messages or you know the bulk of those messages were kind of reinforcing a certain stereotype Hello and welcome to the Filter Coffee podcast. There is an ad for Van Heusen ties from the 1960s where the tagline is show her it is a man's world. And to the same decade another for a ketchup with a screw top that says you mean a woman can open it? One might think we've come a long way from these sexist ads of almost half a century back. But if you switch on the TV even today It is still women protagonists washing clothes in a bucket and getting really excited about their whiteness or mothers still worrying about what to make for their sons and daughters lunch not fathers not men but change is happening gradually painfully gradually but for every 10 stereotypical detergent or fairness ads you also have one that reverses gender roles or is more inclusive These changes are results of everyday battles fought by people in agencies, brands and studios who are seeking change. And not just individuals. Advertising is also one of the most self-regulated industries in the country, even though it doesn't seem like that at the surface. The Advertising Standards Council of India or ASCII is a great example. It is an organization that is actually set up by the industry stakeholders to regulate itself. And if you're not exactly living under a rock, I'm sure you would have noticed that ASCII has been in the news quite frequently these days. Most recently, it had launched a path-breaking guideline on harmful gender stereotypes, which I found quite comprehensive. My guest today is Manisha Kapoor, who is the CEO and the Secretary General of ASCII. Manisha has been associated with ASCII for over half a decade now and in this time the organization has become more visible and active in its efforts to safeguard the consumer's cause than it has ever been in my opinion. Some of you might have heard of the guidelines that ASCII recently put out to regulate the space that influencers play in for example including a guideline that specified how they need to disclose a brand partnership when they're getting paid for a piece of content. I spoke to Manisha about this entire evolution that the industry is going through. How ASCII works, how her own personal journey in advertising and development is helping her shape her vision for this organization, and some of the most interesting pushbacks she's encountered from brands in this journey. Stay with us. We'll be right back on the Filter Coffee podcast. Welcome to the Filter Coffee podcast Manisha how are you doing where are you talking to us from Hi Karthik how are you I'm very good uh, and I'm sitting at my office uh, at the Advertising Standards Council of India so yeah happy to be here this morning with you You know since you mentioned ASCII Manisha I think uh, the audience to the show are not uh, necessarily you know marketers maybe can you break down because I'm sure people in the last year year and a half have been hearing ASCII a lot thanks to many of the efforts you know that, that you've been sort of uh, uh, pioneering there uh, so it's more in the news than ever before but for the uninitiated could you could you break down what is ASCII and what is its role in the larger advertising ecosystem uh, absolutely um, so ASCII uh, as i mentioned earlier stands for the advertising standards council of india and what we do essentially is that we try and keep the advertising industry honest so that's really what our mandate is and we do that uh, in two ways one is that 
uh, we hear grievances, you know, from consumers uh, or anyone else that may have uh, seen an advertisement and feels that it is either misleading uh, or it is, uh, you know, showcasing something which is unsafe to do or, or encouraging people to do unsafe practices or if they find that advertising is, you know, indecent or vulgar. And of course, we can also have, you know, a company filing a complaint with us if it feels that its competitor is being unfair to it. So if it's unfair in competition. So these are the four kind of broad areas that we look at. Um, and if anyone has any objection to an advertisement, they can write into us. We have an independent jury that uh, hears both the complaint, um, uh, you know, as well as any response that we receive from the advertiser and will kind of take a decision on whether, you know, they feel that indeed that ad, uh, you know, was problematic. And if it is the case, then we, um, uh, you know, recommend to the advertiser to withdraw or modify the ad suitably. Hmm. We also do a lot of our own surveillance, so uh, we don't just wait for someone to write into us, uh, but we have a fairly uh, well-established monitoring system, including the use of artificial intelligence and uh, you know a lot of technology, which allows us to uh, identify potentially misleading ads that we can take up on our own as well. So essentially, uh, you know, this is the mainstay of what we do. Of course, we do a lot of work for, you know, helping the industry get it right. You know, sometimes we look at studies, etc., which are not just about ending up in guidelines necessarily. But, you know, how do we also nudge advertisers towards better, more progressive, more honest advertising? So that in a nutshell is what we do. We are an industry body. We are not a government body. I think a lot of people also have that misconception yeah. that we are a government body. So we are uh, an industry body. However, we do have, um, uh, you know, support from the government in terms of being included, you know, in particularly in the Cable and Television Network Act. So, uh, you know, so we do have in that sense a legal backstop, but we are not a statutory body. Right. I'm glad you mentioned that. In fact, I think we should we should probably start with a bit of myth busting on, on ASCII itself so, so people understand, you know, what it is. You know, you, you mentioned that you are an industry body and, and not a government body. You know, I have I have two questions regarding that, right? One is, uh, and again, you know, I'm I'm playing the role of um, a devil's advocate, coming from a layman's perspective. You you're also part of the executive committee of an international, you know, self regulatory body, right? So my my first question to you is, in a way, would you say that ASCII is more an effort by the industry to self regulate itself? By the industry, I mean the marketing slash advertising industry. And second, uh, how good have we been as an industry in, in self-regulating ourselves, both in India as well as internationally? Yeah, so I think, yes, you're absolutely right. It is the industry's effort to self-regulate. And, you know, while self-regulation and, uh, you know, advertising regulation in general, while its primary objective is to protect consumers, uh, you know, from advertisements that may mislead them or may be objectionable in other ways, I think it's also very important to understand that, Self-regulation also protects advertisers who wish to be honest. You know, it creates a level playing field with people who want to be honest versus those who want to break the rules. So by bringing everyone to a common standard and holding everyone responsible to a common standard, uh, we think that, you know, self-regulation creates a win-win for both consumers as well as honest advertisers. The other important thing to remember in self-regulation is that it's much faster you know, as compared to, let's say, if, uh, you know, what you were to go to a consumer court or if you were to kind of file a case in, you know, in a court of law, you know, self-regulation is is much faster. We resolve complaints in anywhere from two to six weeks, depending on the complicated, uh, you know, depending on how complicated it may be or how technical we need to get to evaluate uh, that ad. Remember that it costs nothing to the taxpayer. Anyone can uh, lodge a complaint at ASCII. It is free of cost to consumers, to, uh, you know, any experts. Uh, we've even had in the past a Supreme Court judge filing a case, uh, you know, or, or reporting an ad to ASCII. So I think it really acts as the first line of defense. Of course, I think with digital, you know, we are finding that there's a whole new ecosystem of advertisers, of brands that are coming in and, uh, you know, not all of them come from a very traditional marketing background, uh, possibly. Um, so we do find that educating them, making them aware of their responsibilities as advertisers and being, you know, contributing to the ecosystem instead of dragging it down. I think, you know, those are the challenges that we face. 
being a voluntary compliance body, I mean, we do not implement fines or we cannot ban ads. We are very happy to say that we have over a 94% compliance, uh, voluntary compliance. Wow. So that, I think, speaks for the effectiveness of self-regulation and advertising self-regulation, even globally, you know, you were mentioning is actually one of the most successful forms of self-regulation that works very, very well. In many countries, the government stands very firmly behind self-regulation. And, you know, one of the things that we always say in the self-regulatory world is that the self-regulator acts by exhaustion and the government acts by exception. So the cases that where we do not get voluntary compliance or there are people who are kind of repeat offenders. These are the cases that we bring to the government's attention for them to then bring the full weight of the law, you know, onto these uh, errant uh, advertisers. But where we feel a mistake has been pointed out and the advertiser has voluntarily kind of agreed to correct it, that proportion is very, very high, like I said, at 94%. Right. Which is more than most regulatory mechanisms in this country, right? Marketing or or otherwise, which is just, what I mean is the impact is much more and the time to resolution is much, much shorter. I have a question which you, you can answer or choose to pass or choose to answer without naming anyone in particular. Are there great instances, you know, of this self-regulation? Because someone listening to this, it's quite possible that they might get cynical about, ha, it will never happens. They're just saying this, right? Are there great instances of, uh, you know, where something has been pointed out and an advertiser has been quick to respond, you know, both in terms of time as well as effectiveness, right? In 2021, where a lot of brands started responding to the consumer need to feel safe. We saw, you know, brands right from floor cleaners to uh, soaps, but also brands like, uh, you know, or, or categories like mattresses uh, or air conditioners or, you know, even appliances. In fact, we had a mobile app that promised to cure you of COVID, you know, so Good Lord. <laughs> kind of, yeah, in very, very bizarre examples. And, and I think we became, you know, very quickly aligned to the fact that in most cleansing categories, so like soaps and uh, floor cleaners, etc., a lot of them could demonstrate that, you know, they were able to actually cure 99.9% uh, germs. So, uh, you know, some of those claims were quite true and, and proven. Uh, however, you know, I think a lot of brands which had promised like air conditioners or paints, etc., you know, promising that they would kind of make you know, the environment COVID free was, uh, were all kind of, uh, you know, misleading claims. A lot of them had technology saying that if you touch them, the paint itself will remain COVID free, but that, you know, that doesn't do anything for the people in the room. So, uh, you know, brands, not just directly or technically, but also from an implication point of view, or, you know, how consumers would understand that ad. So for example, if it's an air conditioner, it's not just the air close to the air conditioner, but, you know, as a normal consumer, I would imagine that the viral load in the room uh, you know, was positively impacted by that AC and, you know, it could not demonstrate that. So I think those are some of the instances, you know, that we've come across, uh, particularly over the COVID period, where a lot of brands tried to offer solutions, but some of them were really taking advantage of consumers rather than offering genuine solutions to consumers. You were, I'm assuming, fairly successful in terms of asking them to sort of step back, especially, you know, the app that cures COVID and whatnot. Because what I'm asking is that one of the other gray areas, right, we'll be sticking to this myth-busting route that we've taken. One of the other areas, which is gray, is also how much power does ASCII have, for example, right, to ensure compliance? One, of course, is, is self-regulation, right? But if someone doesn't want to do it, what are the means and ways in which, you know, you're able to sort of ensure that that, that eventually happens? So there are two or three things that happen. Um, one is if it is a TV ad, they will actually not be allowed to air the ad by law. Because as I said, we are part of the Cable and Television Act. And one of the provisions of the advertising codes laid down there is that an ad that is broadcast cannot be in violation of the ASCII code. So even if the advertiser does not want to comply, you know, they will not be allowed to run an ad on television. So that's number one. Secondly, we uh, work quite closely with different government ministries. Uh, we bring these, you know, violative ads to their attention. And we've seen in many cases that the government issues show cause notices, you know, to these errant advertisers who are not complying or, you know, who have not take, undertaken voluntary compliance. Then the law can, you know, put its might behind, uh, you know, the investigations that ASCII has done and use that as a basis for further investigation and their own procedures. So we have seen a lot of government action you know, against these companies, by, you know, when they are then sending them show cause notices. So we work quite closely with different government uh, departments. In fact, a lot of times in the parliament, when there are questions on misleading ads, 
you know, the ASCII data is relied upon to understand what is happening in this country, uh, you know, what is the extent of it, what was the resolutions, etc. So we work, uh, as I said, quite closely with uh, government departments to escalate matters should there not be voluntary compliance. Manisha, over the last five, six years, right, like, like I said at the beginning of the episode, we're seeing a lot of ASCII mentions, right? If I can use this as an analogy, the number of times ASCII is being talked about has moved on from, you know, say an economic times to a times of India, right? Because it has larger impact on, on the society and the way we sort of look at things, right? And I think a couple of them really, really stand out right, in terms of what you're trying to do from a user of influencers space and what you're trying to do, especially in, in, in gender stereotyping, right? I'll just come to that in a bit. But, you know, these also coincide with uh, your tenure in ASCII, leading ASCII. So I'm assuming like like all of our uh, work is a lot of this is also a sort of the personal change that you want to see, right? Talk to us a little bit about, you know, personally, what are the things that you're trying to sort of move the needle on, you know, given that you started off with some of the largest, uh, you know, marketing organizations in the world in Johnson and in Unilever, and then also sort of uh, spent a lot of time in, in the developmental side of things, especially CSR. Right. So talk to us a little bit about your own journey of shaping your convictions and how that is reflecting today in your body of work. Yeah. So I think, you know, I've even before I kind of joined ASCII formally in, in terms of leading the secretariat, I was actually part of the jury that ASCII has, which is the Consumer Complaints Council. So I was on <clears> the council for about four years. That's how I kind of, uh, you know, got introduced to ASCII. Well, actually, that's not Exactly how I got introduced to ASCII. The first time I heard about ASCII when I was a brand manager where my ad got pulled up by ASCII as well. So, um, you know, and at that time, of course, like I'm sure brand managers do today. I was very upset and I said, oh, you know, I mean, they don't understand and stuff like that. So, <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, so I think that was my early kind of uh, introduction to ASCII. I think one of the things that has always excited me about whatever work I do is that how do we realize the potential of the organization or the role uh, or the work that we do? you know, what is actually its full potential. So one of the things that happened when I came into ASCII was that we were, of course, very robust on the corrective side of things, you know, that, that we had a very good complaints mechanism. It was working very well. We had an independent jury. So I think in that sense, the process was very robust. I think there were two things that, you know, I decided and, you know, collectively, of course, uh, at ASCII between me and the board, uh, we decided to push was one is that how do we keep ASCII much more contemporary? And that mm. meant getting into areas like digital, crypto, gaming, influencers, where the narrative is still emerging. Right. I mean, we are in the midst of that change as it's happening. But I think one of the things we said is that, you know, even if it's not perfect, we will understand what is that play right now? How is that impacting consumers? What are the new consumer vulnerabilities that are getting created? And we will bring out these guidelines. And, you know, we will update them if needed, you know, if, if the nature of the industry changes and the nature of advertising formats change, we will keep updating, but we must have a point of view, you know, which protects consumers in these very emerging kind of categories. So I think that's a stance that we took that we will be future facing, that we will work with emerging categories and, you know, work on these new kind of vulnerabilities. The other big thing that we undertook, and, you know, we are continuing several initiatives uh, on that is, how do we also support industry get it right? You know, it's one thing to, uh, you know, my favorite analogy is always of traffic rules that, you know, we don't want to be the traffic policeman standing on the other side of the traffic signal waiting to catch you when you get it wrong. But I also need to be the person who's educating you about traffic rules to say what you can or can't do and why that is important for your safety and the safety of others. Right. So it's not important to just catch people who are getting it wrong. It's equally right. important to educate people and support people get it right. Getting it right has a lot of advantages, both for the industry and for the consumers. If you get it right, it means that your ad will no longer be in trouble later. You know, you can kind of launch your campaign with confidence. You know, you can be reasonably confident that even if there are complaints that you will be able to successfully defend it because you've done your due diligence before. Uh, so that's a great thing. And for consumers, it's also very beneficial because it means there will be fewer misleading ads that you know, they are exposed to. So it's really a win-win where it's not disruptive for advertisers. And at the same time, it's it's great news for consumers. So I think that whole idea of how do we help people get it right? How do we prevent, you know, misleading ads from coming in? And therefore, the whole preventive aspect of self-regulation, I think, 
is gaining traction. We are, you know, putting in a lot of initiatives in that. So whether it's our reports, whether it's our studies, whether it is, um, you know, our engagement with industry, whether it is now, you know, the kind of training programs that we are embarking on. And I don't know if you recently caught, you know, an announcement that we made, uh, which is that we are actually going to be launching an ASCII Academy where, uh, you know, we are going to bring in different stakeholders who are all interested in the preventive aspects of self-regulation and responsibility. So I think those are the big areas of change that we want to undertake as an organization. So if, if I may interrupt you, Flo, who will be a part of this academy? Who are these people that you're, you're targeting? Are they marketers, young marketers? Yeah, so we will look at uh, industry professionals, so young marketers, and of course, even seniors in the industry who are kind right. of, you know, holding decision uh, making, uh, but also students who are, you know, going to join the industry and, you know, they are going to be the marketing leaders of tomorrow. Uh, so we are looking at uh, these kind of programs. We recently did a faculty development program where we, you know, introduced the idea of ethics uh, in advertising and the idea of what is the regulatory framework that students and teachers need to be familiar with. Um, you know, so we are kind of doing these pilots. We are running masterclasses with corporates. So we're doing a lot of these activities, which, you know, we want to now consolidate and expand and scale up um, under the ASCII right. Academy. So we will launch the Academy formally in a few weeks from now. But we are looking at educational institutes as a big part of that ecosystem. We are looking at, of course, corporates to be a big part of that ecosystem. We are looking at consumer organizations to even help educate consumers about their rights as consumers and as citizens of this country. Uh, you know, how can they understand whether an ad is misleading what can they do if they find an ad that is misleading so we are really looking at a ecosystem wide kind of uh, view on this one and uh, you know which is why the need to kind of consolidate each of these and increasingly we will find that this will become over the next few years a larger part of ASCII today it's a small part because we've just begun it and ASCII is still predominantly known for its corrective action, but we will see a lot of preventive action becoming more and more center stage and, you know, kind of going shoulder to shoulder with the corrective action as well. Right. My experience, you know, Manisha, is that after spending about a decade in this industry, I feel that, you know, what we do as marketers are in a way a reflection of what we see as individuals, right? And our own personal understanding of the society, right? So, so from that perspective, I feel, you know, society influences marketing more than the the other way around, right? Uh, and that's just true, especially if you, if you go down the life cycle of any ad or any uh, piece of campaign or any content for that matter. It all has its roots on a, on a great consumer insight that, that someone has observed somewhere, right? And, you know, recently there was this, uh, this thing where, you know, some of these old print ads were widely shared. Right. And especially the ones ones in the US and even even the one in India. And I could see that the the gender stereotyping over there was just extraordinary, especially when it came to the role of a woman, you know, especially in cleaning products or or anything else. It's almost like you have to make the man happy and, and you know, here are the tools that will help you do so. Right. In, in, in many cases, extraordinarily demeaning. Right. I can see that we've come a long way in terms of uh, advertising, but that's only it's not a credit to advertising. It's credit to the society, which has become more more conscious right where i'm going with this is uh, you know the the recently released guidelines on harmful gender stereotypes by ASCII. right i have so many questions on this right my first thing when i read the the press release on this was that this is extraordinarily exhaustive you're talking about gender stereotyping and you're talking about the usage of of children in advertising to different uh, uh, sexual orientation so on and so forth right any kind of stereotyping that is possible so it's very exhaustive in that sense, right? I wanted to sort of talk to you, of course, we'll talk a lot about some of the things that are there in these guidelines, but I want to talk to you about the, the life cycle of this itself, right? Why did you think it was important for ASCII to put this out? What were your, your personal motivations, right? And how did you arrive at what was the journey of this whole guideline? Yeah, so uh, I think it's that's a great question. And again, I think an area that personally I kind of uh, loved working. I have learned so much, uh, you know, through this as well. I think one of the challenges that happens, you know, and, and this pushback will always come from a marketer. And I did it when I was, uh, you know, on that side as well, is that again, we are reflecting society and what's wrong in that. And I think 
you know, but as people who are intelligent and empathetic to our consumers, one of the things that we must also remember is that society itself has a lot of harmful stuff going on. Now, as advertisers, do we want to reinforce that or opportunistically take advantage of that? Uh, I think that's the question to be asked. Uh, you know, so there are, so, uh, you know, as you said rightly that, you know, it's, there are certain expectations that are there on women in real life today, uh, you know, that she will cook and not complain that, you know, she will handle both the outside and the inside. And just because she's working outside doesn't mean that she's not got to be on the top of her kitchen or, you know, or she's still responsible for cleaning her house and things like that. And these are all real. So, you know, we are not kind of arguing that, uh, you know, this is not happening in society. But when you spend billions and billions of rupees and dollars over different categories, over decades, over all different media, you know, and they say that an ordinary consumer today is exposed to six to 10,000 pieces of advertisements in a day. Now, imagine if all of those messages or, you know, bulk of those messages were kind of reinforcing a certain stereotype. So I think advertising must also not come in the way of society's progress. And, you know, by spending a lot of money in reinforcing what is harmful in society, you know, just because you want to sell a product, I think is really harmful to um, both advertising and to society. So I think at least as advertisers, uh, you know, we need to be cognizant of that responsibility that we have, you know, and uh, not kind of hide behind we are reflecting society argument. And I think that's very important. Uh, so I think that was, in a sense, uh, you know, the discovery that we started on when we looked at gender. I think these, you know, and there's such interesting kind of stereotypes that came out, like I said, this whole thing of even what we consider as progressive advertising, which is women working outside of the home and things like that. You know, and how many ads that we can remember, can we see a woman doctor who's actually operating or is actually giving an advice to a patient? We always see her in a lab coat returning home so she can tell her child, ki, tum dholo, ya, you know, ye washing machine, ye wali theek hai, whatever. So it's all about you're using the woman as, I mean, you know, you kind of say it's a progressive ad because I've shown the woman working outside of home. But what is she doing? You know, she's now not only got the responsibility of doing things outside, but she continues to bear the burden of what she has to do at home. Right. Another very interesting example that we came across. And again, you know, you would see this in so many ads is, again, so-called progressive advertising where men are entering the kitchen. But what happens when the men enter the kitchen? There is such a celebration around it, right? I mean, the whole household gathers around and, you know, he may just have actually boiled water or made tea. But there is such a celebration that it communicates that this is not normal. I mean, this is something which is so extraordinary, you know, that it needs to be celebrated in this manner. And then what are you doing? You are not normalizing men entering the kitchen, uh, you know, whereas... Actually, in some ways, in society, that is already happening. Uh, you know, I yeah. don't think today if, uh, you know, if uh, the man of the house makes tea, I don't think the whole family gathers around him and claps, right? I mean, it's not normal. So what is advertising doing? And in some cases, therefore, we feel that particularly in the portrayal of gender and gender dynamics, that advertising actually lags behind where society has already moved. We don't see these kind of things in, in real homes anymore. And, uh, you know, so why should brands continue to reinforce uh, and normalize things which are not great for our society? So I think that's where it started. And of course, you know, when we looked at Gender Next, which was a study, and, you know, we looked at... Um, I think more than 600 ads, we decoded them, we spoke to several consumers, and we really found out that consumers, and particularly young women, don't find advertising very aspirational, or not this kind of advertising very aspirational. You know, where a woman is smilingly washing vessels. I mean, who smiles when they wash vessels? How are you kind of, uh, you know, you normalize that this is such a great and interesting thing to do? And, you know, which woman feels like that, you know? So I think a lot of women really pointed out and you know, as I said, particularly the younger ones, that this is not aspirational. This is not what I want to be doing. And, you know, I don't want to receive the compliments of men. I mean, that's not what I'm striving for anymore. You know, I'm, I have other things to do and I have bigger battles to, you know, win and, and go out and fight. So I think women themselves have moved a lot. And advertising, I think, needs to keep pace with that. Now, during this whole exercise, so why we came across a lot of things which were desirable and we want to nudge advertisers to push that. We also came across some things which were, Actually, now they're bordering the unacceptable. And that was the birth of the guidelines in a sense. So the Gender Next report itself, to my mind, nudges advertisers to be more progressive. But the gender guidelines tells them, look, where are we drawing the line? And, you know, when you do this, this is not acceptable anymore. So I think that was, in a sense, the split between the report, which is a encouragement to advertisers and, and a great 
you know, document which has so many beautiful insights and so many powerful insights that advertisers could use on to not only make their advertising better, but also more effective. So, in fact, one of the, you know, joint papers we did with Kantar, which is um, a leading marketing, uh, market research agency, and they do probably the most amount of ad testing in India. They found through their uh, research that, you know, when ads are gender positive and, uh, you know, that it actually increases your brand equity score by 51% and short-term sales intent by 21%. I mean, those are numbers as a brand manager, I would give an arm in a leg for, right? And, you know, it's it's not that difficult to do if you kind of just pick up the Gender Next report and read it and, uh, you know, get, get your gender uh, narrative right in advertising. So I think, you know, that really was a story. Like I said, for us, it was such a discovery ourselves. I mean, things that we take for granted and we are blind to, when you start seeing that as a pattern, you kind of recognize uh, that this is a problem. I'll give you another example of um, the financial sector category, uh, particularly credit cards, where women are always shown with shopping bags. And it only stands out because men are never shown with shopping bags. So again, what is it that you're trying to say that you are trying to kind of portray women as only spenders and, you know, what happens to, let's say, their investments or the fact that, you know, even men spend on, you know, on, on their own things, right? So I think those are the stereotypes that, you know, we would rather not have advertising spend crores of rupees. Yeah, I mean, in fact, uh, <laughs> I hope I don't get into trouble with saying this, but, you know, w- one of the briefs you are working with, you know, is um, we, we went with multiple ideas on a particular area to, to this particular client. But they kept saying that, you know, the, the protagonist you're, you're working with, the homemaker is not as, as forward as, as, as what you feel. Okay. So the pen portrait they had created for this was uh, was Mrs. Meerut. Okay. And they said that Mrs. Meerut is like this, like this. No, she won't, she won't understand technology at this time. And after two, three presentations, uh, I got very frustrated. And then I, I sent two very young people from my my team. Uh, I just booked them tickets to go to Meerut, stay there for two days and just speak to this Mrs. Me- actual Mrs. Meerut's there and uh, come back with the study. We didn't tell the client we're doing this, right? And in the next meeting, we presented an idea which involved technology and then he said no 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 mrs Meerut is not like that predictably and then we played this video of actual mrs Meerut speaking right and not only is she extraordinarily on top of tech she is not just the person who runs the household in many cases she's a person running the community around her whether it's a colony or whether it is a street she's the one filing civil complaints so on and so forth right so i think marketers come probably you know come from a certain generation and uh, their their mind is set on certain stereotypes, and which is what probably reflects in many of the advertising that we see as well. You know, going back to what you said, right? I absolutely love the I love the exhaustiveness in which you know you, you're handling it because when I went through the the guidelines, it is also very clear that you're not talking about one time usage of something, right? In fact, uh, if I can quote some parts of the guidelines, it says that. Um, Things that are always uniquely associated with a particular gender and uh, saying that some things are the only options available to a particular gender or some things which are never carried out or displayed by any other gender. Those are the things, you know, that are that are problematic, right? So so in that sense, you know, you, you're, what you're targeting is, is the repeat offenders space who are actually reinforcing the stereotype, isn't it? Yeah. And also for the ad, not to suggest that, right? So for example, if there is an ad, which, um, uh, you know, let's say is is showing a woman cooking and that's fine. But if let's say the ad suggests that, you know, this is really only a woman's job. uh, So it may be a single piece of ad, but if it is kind of suggesting that this Cooking is only associated with women, cannot be associated with men. For example, if it's mocking a man for being in the kitchen, uh, then that is something we would hold problematic. I think just another point that I wanted to kind of bring up, uh, you know, in the context of what you uh, mentioned, uh, you know, earlier. And I think that is so right. If You know, there's a generation gap between advertisers and women and influencers you know, broadcasting their own content, you know, earlier one had to kind of go and meet all of these people. I mean, today you can open, you know, a YouTube or an Instagram and see the kind of content that people are posting about themselves. You know, there are young women and even older women, I mean, by by just young women who have reinvented themselves, who are putting out their own stories, you know, for uh, and, and broadcasting their own stories and narratives. And if you see those depictions, 
they are so different from advertising depictions. You know, I don't think any of them is putting out pictures of themselves washing vessels or washing clothes and being very excited about it. Um, you know, the excitement in their yeah. lives stem from other places. And of course, they, you know, they do want their houses clean and they do want their laundry clean. But, you know, I think that that equation with some of these categories is now just very exaggerated in advertising. That's no longer the reality. And I think that acknowledgement, uh, you know, how do you kind of carry that forth from how women are broadcasting themselves today? Uh, you know, I think is, is uh, you know, if one were to study that, I mean, there's really a stunning gap in, in uh, the generational thinking, uh, you know, on that front. Yeah. You know, one of these areas, uh, in a, when, when you were talking about this, the image that came to my mind was for decades now, we, we show women are excited about clothes becoming whiter, isn't it? Like this is always the same bucket. There's always the same one dip and then you take it out and then, you know, it becomes brighter. Right. Moving on, you know, we, when we talk about these, I think an area which is extraordinarily sensitive I and mean, in some ways, some, some bit of self-regulation is happening in this space is beauty. Isn't it right? Especially you know skin colors and how we sort of you know propagate that 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 fair is 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 better, so on and so forth. While while some of these organizations, some of these brands are also sort of reinventing their own narrative. Those are probably more more complex problems for you to take on, aren't they? Uh, well, both yes and no. I think uh, ASCII, in fact, brought out fairness guidelines, uh, you know, more than 10 years back. So we have a category of uh, guidelines for fairness screens. And some of the changes that we drove at that point. So now, again, banning a category of ads is not under our purview. It's not under our remit. We are not the government, right? However, we, again, recognized the potential harm it was causing and said that, look, when you show someone who is dark, you cannot show them as being depressed. You cannot show them as being unhappy and you cannot show them as being unsuccessful. You cannot relate that to the color of the skin, right? So you can, I mean, if your product works to deliver, you can show that, but you cannot show a transformation in their life and their attitude towards life. Uh, you know, that is unacceptable. To portray people who are dark as, uh, you know, people who are losing something in life is not acceptable. So this was a guideline that came in, in fact, close to 10 years back. And I think that also brought about, uh, you know, and nudged advertisers again to the kind of changing advertising even in that sector. Uh, so, you know, where if you again compare, let's say, the ads of the 80s or 90s to the ads that you're seeing now, there is a huge difference, you know, where you would always show a person who is dark is kind of losing out on opportunities in life or, you know, that they're just very sad or depressed about the way yeah. they are or look. And that you don't see in advertising anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's massive. You know, just shifting gears, Manisha, the, the other space where you've had phenomenal impact is in the way brands use influencers, isn't it? And I think uh, what I love about this is ASCII has been way ahead of the curve in understanding that, hey, listen, this is the next era of advertising. You know, creators are the next television commercials, right? So if you don't regulate this ahead of time, then this is not going to be you know, possible for us or easy for us to do so. And, uh, you know, in, in my experience, right, while while internationally, the IAB, which is uh, uh, sort of similar in their uh, purpose uh, to, to ASCII, I feel, sort of put out some guidelines in India, we didn't really have much regulation up until recently, isn't it? And uh, some of the, the things that, that come out of that is about how creators should disclose themselves, so on and so forth, right? Like the way we spoke about uh, gender stereotyping, talk to us about a little bit of the journey of how that happened. What triggered in you the urgency to, to get that going? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think, again, we saw that, as you rightly said, as something which was becoming more and more mainstream in advertising. Uh, and, you know, we saw more and more brands kind of get engaged with that kind of advertising. Uh, and I think if you couple that with the fact that it is very difficult now to distinguish content from advertising online, right, where, uh, you know, the, those lines between content and advertising are quite blurry. Uh, you know, on television, it's very clear what's a program and what's an ad, but really on the digital space, one doesn't know. And I think that impacts the consumer's ability to take an informed decision. You know, they have influencers that they trust and they blindly follow and they actually see them as friends and as, uh, you know, people who are guiding them, you know, rather than representatives of brands. And therefore, if an influencer kind of suggests a particular product, so either a face cream or something that they're using in their home, uh, you know, consumers would give that far more credence than they would give to a piece of advertisement. And it is not right for consumers to now assume that this is not advertised right so i think the fundamental principle of this is just the consumer's right to be able to take an informed decision and disguised ads uh, you know kind of prevent that 
so the key thing is for us to a recognize that you know what influencers are putting out are advertisements and they come under the definition of advertisements and that therefore it needs to be disclosed as an advertisement so consumers can take an informed choice when we started this exercise we actually spoke to many influencers we spoke to agencies that were kind of managing influencers so big bang social uh, you know was a, a key partner of ours at that point of time we had some representation from google on our task force you know we had a couple of influencers that we were de- deeply kind of in conversation with to so i think just for us to understand uh, you know the dynamics of this industry how does it work you know what are influencers own views and i think one of the very interesting things that we discovered was that the influencers really loved the guidelines that they in fact wanted more stringent guidelines because i think it yeah. also allowed them an equal footing to deal with brands you know other than the very large influencers you know most of the mid or small sized influencers i mean there's such an asymmetry between the brands and and them as individual you know companies and what can they kind of push back to the brand on and you know and anecdotally we know this that you know companies may pay influencers x amount if you declare it as an ad but i'm willing to pay you x plus something if you don't declare it as an ad and that's a misleading practice as far as consumers are concerned and i think now with the use of these guidelines i think the influencers can also push back because i think the influencers also realize and should realize that again you know their own brand and their own following comes because consumers think that they are authentic and you know real and that is in a sense the big difference between influencers and let's say more formal advertising right is that the reason why they are followed is because of their authenticity and if they start to compromise on that and if consumers you know realize that okay i mean you know they're talking of brands and it's because they are paid i mean they might stop uh, you know believing you uh, you know that closely but when you are declaring that it's a brand and you know you may be paid by a brand and still genuinely think that the product is great and you know uh, we have no angst against that but it allows the consumer to apply whatever filters they want in their own minds to you know to kind of interpret that message and that's a fair playing field So like I said we had a lot of these conversations uh, we continue to have conversations with influencers uh, you know with with brands that are using them um, we also seen increasing number of cases that we are taking up contributed to close to 30% of the complaints we took up last year and and the response has wow. been good I would say that there is still some wait for us to go because not all influencers are still aware of you know what ASCII is or what the guidelines are or what are the principles of honesty in uh, in influencing and in creating ads in this category so i would say we still have a long way to go but we do i think just increasingly anecdotally see a lot more content which has declared that it's paid advertising or it's a yeah. partnership etc so we are seeing that culture kind of catch up and uh, today consumers tag us on things that they find you know i mean they see something from an influencer and you know they are recognizing it also as advertisements and they kind of tag ask so i think that culture of uh, both a vigilant consumer as well as responsible influencer is growing and that really is great news so i think that's again an initiative we are very very proud of you know having taken and i think it's a continuing conversation no i i think one of the as a marketer we we our conversations most of our conversations most of our clients today revolve around creators and then influencers right and i think one of the common myths here is that you know if an influencer declares that something is a paid partnership then the engagement with that content reduces or something like that right i, I think empirically we found that that is not the case right i feel today a consumer understands the life cycle of a creator and an influencer understands that this really is a vocation it's not that someone is doing this in their free time and it's a vocation and if it is a vocation they have to earn somewhere and uh, brand partnerships are a great way of keeping it going and then they understand and they are very cognizant and supportive of it but they also feel that uh, somewhere the influencer has enough integrity to do a brand partnership with with brands or stories that they believe in right and and if they believe in conscientiously then then i'm also sort of you know sort of believing in it as a follower of that influencer right so there is a level of trust fabric that is between these two and uh, you know across most metrics we don't really see a huge dip or perceptible dip in terms of engagement with content which are which are declared right so in, in that sense i think your your intuition is, is sort of uh, proved right in this case isn't it and, and, and it's also true that it, most markets or phenomenon that are regulated tend to grow much faster than a completely unregulated market isn't it no absolutely and i think as influencer advertising becomes more mainstream there is an absolute need not just again i said for consumers but again 
also for honest brands you know i mean even brands will start wanting to engage with influencers that are honest you know i've uh, you know recently we came across a case of a really really large uh, multinational brand uh, where a couple of influencers had taken their briefs and really done something uh, you know i mean in, in a sense gone way beyond in terms of claim articulation you know that uh, versus what the company could demonstrably prove and i think therefore Uh, you know companies are also going to be less and less in charge of their own content yeah. uh, you know if i yeah. look back to my days of uh, advertising and even maybe as recently as you know 5 years back you know every word and even now you know tvcs or print ads you know every word and every full stop is debated right but when you kind of give a brief to an influencer you know as a brand you have a little influence over their content right yeah. um, and therefore i think even brands would want to work with people of integrity you know they don't want to risk their brands with people who are irresponsible so i think again you know the whole ecosystem benefits when there is honesty and transparency and therefore i feel again it's in the interest of honest influencers and the interest of honest brands that they push this agenda and they bring it to the forefront because in the long run there is really no other way you know otherwise you, you can have a whole industry collapsing before it has had the chance to really find its feet and grow if dishonesty becomes the foundation and you know a misleading consumer becomes what we associate with influencers i think it's a great loss to the ecosystem you know so i think it's a very vibrant form of you know advertising and communication and uh, i think both brands and influencers need to nurture it uh, well for it to grow in the right way absolutely right you know uh, like like i said at the beginning manisha we, we're all uh, both as marketers and as consumers very excited that there is visible regulation today right visible self regulation if i may put it that way right by by the industry which you know as we know in the form of visible governance is always it generates much more positivity generates much more uh, benefits to the end consumer so on and so forth so if i if i may stretch our hope and ask you what are some of the the things that you're working on today that that we can see from aski in the coming months and years yeah so i think two or three initiatives uh, one is as i mentioned earlier i think the whole preventive initiative on uh, you know with the aski academy something that you will hear much more of in the coming weeks also a couple of other areas that we are working on uh, i mean at this point it's premature for me to say whether it would result in regulation uh, but two areas of interest that we are looking at is one is edtech so just as we uh, you know undertook this massive study on gender next uh, and gender representation in advertising Uh, we are currently working on a study on the ed- tech sector education per se which includes the entire ecosystem uh, you know of private universities coaching classes all of that um, you know we've seen a big big violators of uh, advertisement uh, regulation so the by and large we find that they are very very misleading all of them promising employment or grades or you know adjudicating themselves to be like the number one university or the most awarded university where yeah. a lot of the awards are dubious uh, the rankings are fake so we've seen a lot of that happening with ad tech coming in while i think numerically the number of ads are still low but you know of course it's an area that has a huge impact because of the sheer spends that are happening behind that category so i think that you know is is something again that we want to make sure that as this industry grows and progresses that it does so keeping the sensitivities of all stakeholders in mind that you know it's not just consumers but whether it's regulators governments academicians you know people who are invested in the future of this country have a point of view on um, on their advertising as well and you know how can the industry be more cognizant of those points of view um, you know and, and kind of work together with uh, with these different stakeholders so that's something that we are undertaking i think in the next again few weeks uh, you know we will be ready with our report and i think post that we will you know discuss with the industry with government other stakeholders whether there is a need for a specific guideline or whether by and large our current guidelines uh, you know can can uh, kind of address the concerns with the sector uh, that's number one the other very interesting thing that we have started to put together some thoughts on our uh, what we call dark patterns uh, on the internet now dark patterns are basically manipulative ui ux platforms that uh, steer you towards choices which may not necessarily be in your best interest uh, let me give you a simple example you know when you buy an airline ticket you have the choice to opt out of insurance charges which are actually optional you know but if you yeah. kind of miss that and it's put in you know somewhere where the main information is somewhere else and i mean that is what ui ux design is about right i mean it's about where it's leading your attention all the while so if it reduces the spotlight on something which is going to cost you extra you know that 
uh, is an unfair thing to do. Or uh, let me give you another example. Let's say you are buying clothes on, uh, you know, an e-commerce site and you suddenly like something and then when you click on it, it says last two pieces left. Now, is that an actual reflection of inventory? Uh, versus is that just, again, something told to you to kind of accelerate your choice? So that's one. Other kind of uh, interfaces like, you know, is what we call drip pricing, uh, which is that you sign up for something and then there are a lot of compulsory charges, which everyone has to pay. But, you know, you kind of by the time you sign out, your bill has doubled, you know, and therefore you didn't have uh, enough information or enough correct information about the price of what you're buying when you made your choice and it's only at the checkout stage that you realize what uh, you know the bill is and it's vastly different from what you uh, initially kind of bought into in some cases things like how much data they are let you know or they're asking you to share in order for you to access certain uh, very basic you know uh, information on the website which if you said no i mean you could still access right so it's again kind of uh, you know kind of asking you to share more data than is mandated by their own website and the, the only reason is that the way it is presented is you feel that if you don't enter this, you don't have a choice to go forward. Yeah. So yeah. I think these are all examples of dark patterns, uh, which are creating new consumer vulnerabilities today. Uh, and that's an area that we are studying. Some of them have to do with advertising. Some of them are actually beyond the scope of advertising. Uh, but we are putting together a task force to study these various aspects and um, some of them we may be able to take on and do, so whether it's again guidelines or we'll see whether it's just a tweak of our existing guidelines. And some of it, we will talk to other stakeholders, uh, you know, who can, you know, possibly have more direct control over unfair trade practices or unfair practices uh, when it comes to consumers, you know, to address some of these issues going forward. So I think these are the two things that uh, we are working on from um, guideline protection kind of space. And as I said, ASCII Academy is going to be the big project that we are from a preventive uh, point of view. Right. In closing, just to put this in perspective, it's amazing that the, the industry is, uh, in a way, you know, ASCII is an investment by the industry into self-regulation, isn't it? Right. So by, by extension, this is this is the way, these are areas in which the industry itself is is, is, is investing in, isn't it? So I think anyone who who's, uh, who's listening to this as a consumer will probably feel that Indian advertising is in very safe hands. Right, at least in terms of the regulatory initiatives. Manisha, thank you so much uh, for breaking this down for us. I've been meaning to have this chat for a very long time. I'm glad we could finally do this. And and more power to you in, in the things that you're pursuing right now. Oh, thanks. It's, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to, I think, speak about ASCII and what it's doing, um, uh, you know, and through platforms like yours kind of, uh, you know, also uh, inform the larger audiences and stakeholders of, of what work we are doing and kind of invite them to be a part of it, you know, in, in whatever capacities they kind of see fit. So thank you very much. Uh, and, you know, it kind of also is, uh, is good, like I said, to present the work that ASCII is doing outside. We don't always have the opportunities to do that. So thank you for uh, this opportunity to speak about ASCII's work. Thank you. Bye. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. You can listen to us on the IBM podcast app or ibmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IBM podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am the underscore Karthik. That's Karthik with an H on Twitter. And filter underscore coffee. That's coffee with a K on Instagram. <laughs>